I want to give a big thank you to all my patrons, and I'll be doing a Kingsguard roll call after today's video. Welcome back to the Fans Network, everyone. My name is, of course, Jimmy Nuts, and today we are going to be going over the Dandelion Dynasty by Ken Liu in a no-spoiler fashion. And I know some people are saying you're going to review the entire series in a no-spoiler way. Why not throw some spoilers in? And the reason is simply this. I didn't put out a review for books three and four, so this is largely going to be my impressions of The Veiled Throne and then Speaking Bones, which just came out this past week. Uh, if I added spoilers, this video could possibly be like an hour to an hour and a half long. So I decided to do a non-spoiler thoughts kind of video and reaction and review, and then save my spoiler thoughts for a discussion possibly with Tall Guy Reads and RJ Gibson and maybe a few others. This might be on my channel, might be on theirs, I'm not really sure. But in the future, I will be talking full of spoilers for The Veiled Throne and Speaking Bones. But today, I'm really just going to give you an idea of what I think of the Dandelion Dynasty as a whole now that I've finished it and really what I thought of books three and four, because they were actually split for publication. They originally were supposed to be read together, supposed to be one book, but apparently you can't have a 2,000 page book. They don't let you do that. They can't bind it. <laughs> I did receive an advanced reader copy of Speaking Bones from Lisa and Ken Liu, so thank you so much to them. I did let them know that I was moving, so I probably wasn't gonna be able to finish it before the release date, which, as you can tell, I'm releasing this video. I did not finish it before the release date, which sucks. This is why I don't usually do ARCs. But I was very excited to receive it because I knew I was gonna be reading Speaking Bones because I love the Dandelion Dynasty. If you're wondering what my thoughts in depth are for books one and two, you can find those reviews here on the channel. They are spoiler and no spoiler reviews all in one. So check those out if you're really curious about what I thought in books one and two. This is mainly going to cover books three and four. And also, it's my first time shooting in my library room. Could you just let me know down in the comments, like how does this look, how do I sound? I had to go back to the clip mic because I think there might be a little bit of an echo in here. If the audio is terrible in this video, I apologize. I'm trying some new things, folks. So how was the Dandelion Dynasty in my experience? Well, as you know, I ranked Grace of Kings and Wall of Storms to be fabulous books. I actually gave Wall of Storms five stars and I said it could be my book of the year. I think right now it still is my book of the year. There's a lot of tough competition. Uh, the Veiled Throne had some big shoes to fill, and I had known going into this that this is really a part one of a book three that got split. And I will say, I think the book does suffer as an individual installment in the series from being split. With that said, first half of The Veiled Throne of book three was as good as Wall of Storms, in my opinion. I mean, I was really like, I can't believe people are sleeping on this book. And then in the back half of the book, it becomes a lot more evident that things are not going to get uh, wrapped up nice and neatly and set up into a book four. Um, a lot of things are kind of like, wonder what happens next. There's some cliffhangers. Uh, not everything gets resolved. Uh, however, in that second half of the book, I did feel like the character development for specifically some of the newer characters that appear in book three was just outstanding. And I think that's the thing that's most impressive about the second half of the series in book three and four is that I actually believe that it is a new generation in Dara. I actually believe <laughs> in the relationships between the children and their parents. And that's not something that you see a lot in fantasy. Usually, you know, you have your main cast of characters and they are the adults of the whole thing and the kids stay the kids. Maybe you have a coming of age story in there somewhere. But Kenley, you actually went and he tackled a really big challenge in bringing in an entire new generation of Dara and did it fabulously in my opinion. Even though I didn't love The Veiled Throne, uh, I, was, I would say it's probably my least favorite of the four, I have to say that for the pieces of the story, and you'll know what I'm talking about if you read the book, in the back half, there's this event that kind of just takes over the narrative. I did not care for it. I didn't find it all that interesting. But regardless of all that, Ken Lee was such a great writer, and the character development that was happening in the situation that I wasn't super interested in was so good that it never like dropped below like a really good read for me. And I think that that's kind of impressive when you read a book that you know that you're not really into the plot of, uh, of the event that's happening. And I actually could be in the minority of this because the events that happen in the second half of The Veiled Throne, I know some people think it's fantastic. It's just kind of out of left field a little bit. Uh, and again, since it's no spoilers, I can't really say much about it, but I'd be curious if you have read it. Did the second half of Veiled Throne land with you? Can you let me know? Because it's like a 50-50 split from everyone that I see react to this book. But regardless of how I felt about the first half to the second half of this book, the one theme that kind of happens because of this generational switch is the theme of parenting. And it's not just one set of parents or even one set of, or multiple sets of parents in one uh, culture. 
It's multiple cultures. It's multiple secessions. It's multiple dynasties. It's, it's a lot. And Ken Liu gives you many different perspectives of what it means to be a parent and to pass on power and also to pass on responsibility over other people. I mean, it, it, it's really su such an intriguing thing to think about because usually, you know, it's like, oh, the king and then there's a secession. Maybe there's a little bit of a feud, but like, what about the kids who are definitely never in line, right? Like that, those kids have to do something. And Ken Liu didn't let anybody sit on the sidelines and any of the families, they all had something to do and a part to play in this story. And I thought that that was one of the things about this book that kind of put it above a lot of other mid books that I've read while still not being my favorite. Uh, the themes of parenting and secession are, are all over this and also just responsibility of a regency over their people. This really gets exemplified in Speaking Bones, but it comes into the stage <laughs> in The Veiled Throne and that is the fact that the antagonist in this story are possibly the most hateable protagonist of all time. I'm talking worse than Lancelot, worse than Kyle from Live Ships, uh, just absolutely despicable, hateable antagonist uh, that I cannot stand. And it's not just one, it's two, maybe even three people in the story that are just so detestable. Yet, I have to admit, I think that they're believable in the world that's set up. And all of the, <clears throat> all of the culture smashing that we see results in you having to see things from both sides. And you do get to see both sides because of the omniscient narrator. And that helps make these not just mustache twirling, though one kind of teeters on that line a bit. Uh, but overall, maybe out of all the characters, the strongest are the antagonists, especially in The Veiled Throne and what it transpires uh, into in Speaking Bones. I think it's probably time to talk about Speaking Bones at this point because really The Veiled Throne is the first half of the last book. I mean, that's really what this was supposed to be. You're supposed to read them together. Uh, obviously, Speaking Bones wasn't out when I finished The Veiled Throne, so I had to wait just a few weeks, but Speaking Bones has so many resolutions in it uh, that it's, it's almost, it's like a breakneck pace. Even though there are times where I thought the plot slowed down to a point where I was like, okay, like we have an ending coming up, right? <laughs> um, but the thing I want to say about Speaking Bones and the Dandelion Dynasty overall that hopefully I can drive home to you is that I have come to expect in large thousands and thousands of pages series that you're not going to get all the resolutions that you want, that you're not going to get every endpoint uh, wrapped up in a, neat, in a neat and nice bow. The Dandelion Dynasty, out of everything I've read, possibly has the best resolutions to every single little piece of the plot that comes together. And I say this, in two, and really, I wanna say that for two different reasons. One is, you don't see that very often, and it shows that Ken Liu had a command over what story he wanted to tell the whole way through the series, which we all know there are series where people seem to lose their way as authors, and sometimes it almost feels like they lose the plot a little bit. Ken Liu never has that issue, in my opinion. I think he knew exactly what he was gonna do from the outset, and I'm sure things changed, but. I always felt like he was writing with confidence to these endpoints that were very, very satisfying. The other reason why I mention this is because of how everything does get wrapped up and not everything's happy and everything's hunky-dory, but some of it feels kind of <clears throat> not contrived. I don't think that's the word, but convenient maybe is the better word. Um, for instance, there is stuff from a certain character that has been scheming all the way back from book one. And when you see this plan laid out, you go, wow, that's amazing. And especially from a thematic standpoint and what it means to be a ruler and make the right shot, call the right shots and do the right thing for the masses instead of just for your own self. There's tons of thematic value to this one character. But when you look back at all four books and you say, man, that all got tied up and that was all like on purpose, that's crazy. It takes a lot of foresight. It can feel a little bit convenient, like things do happen. That's not to say that things always go perfect in the series. That's actually not the case at all. There's a ton of trials that they have to overcome, uh, the, that the protagonists have to overcome, and they do. Uh, but when things do end up working out, sometimes it can feel just a little bit of like an optimistic situation. I don't necessarily think that this is the biggest negative of all time. In fact, I'll take a series that maybe has a little bit of conveniences over one that kind of loses its way and leaves all these big open doors. And not like philosophically leaving doors open, I mean literally not wrapping up stuff in the series. We've kind of just come to expect that from fantasy authors. We say, well, they're not going to do everything, it's too big. Well, Dara's massive. The Dandelion Dynasty is massive. And Ken Liu wrapped up every single plot point I can think of. 
even the ones that seemed so insignificant and characters that did not seem like they had a mainstay in the series ended up playing a role in the overarching narrative, but also for like their own little personal story. And that is really, really special and not something that we see all the time. The Dandelion Dynasty sticks the landing, folks. And I think that that deserves a round of applause because everything that's set up from book one has a purpose. Uh, and whenever you see that vision come true and the way the last few chapters really wrap up, um, it's amazing. I mean, Dara feels like a real place. It feels like somewhere that you could visit. This is one of the most well-realized fantasy worlds that I have ever read. Ken Liu knows every single detail that he's been crafting in this world over the last 10 years. And all of the logic inside of that world is consistent, and that is phenomenal. As far as things that I, I did not care for in Speaking Bones, there were um, times where there was a bit of a repetitive nature where our and protagonists would get the upper hand and then they'd run into a problem, and then we'd have a flashback to show them engineering a solution. This is a pattern, and this is the way Ken Liu has told his story throughout. You could actually probably point back to the earlier books and seeing this happening as well. It just started to grate on me a little bit in book four. I've actually backed up a little bit saying that I'm not a fan of flashbacks in my stories. I used to say that all the time. And then someone said, hey, you know, you like a lot of books with flashbacks, so maybe you actually do like flashbacks. So I'm not going to say I don't like flashbacks, but this is kind of what I was talking about whenever I would bring that up on Chatting with Nuts or some of my other reviews, is there are times where a flashback in the middle of a battle or a really big payoff scene, it can kill the momentum for me. And that did happen here. What I will say to counteract myself, because I love challenging myself constantly with these things, because uh, I'm always convinced I don't know what I'm talking about. Ken Liu took the challenge of explaining things that could have remained ambiguous and been passable in terms of fantasy. But he said, I didn't craft this world and the science in it and the engineering in it and the invention in it for nothing. I'm going to take on that challenge as an author and make this all make sense. So if you are a fan of things making sense and being consistent in world, there may be no better series than the Dandelion Dynasty. Uh, and that's why I don't take like a point off for that or anything because he did. He took the harder way. He took the most interesting path, you could say, uh, to describing how someone or a group of people would overcome issues that they face in the world. So even though I did feel like it got a little bit repetitive in some of the battles, uh, overall, it was done so well that it's hard to argue against. And Ken Liu has been consistent throughout the entire series on how he tells his stories, how it goes about his battles. So this is nothing new. It's just something after reading thousands and thousands of pages, uh, and I was moving at this time, um, I kind of felt myself being like, ah, another flashback, I'm only getting to read one chapter a day. This kind of, this stinks for me. So that's one thing that I did want to mention that I found to uh, kind of lose momentum in the middle of the story. However, the battles themselves were fantastic. We also were not done learning about the world and the history of Dara in book four, which I really appreciated because that makes it feel like there's still so much more to know even now that book four is done. Not in the sense that things are open, uh, like open and not resolved, but just like the world is really living and breathing and has an actual lineage. Really amazing stuff. There's a uh, creation tale that gets told in Speaking Bones that I was enthralled by. And if Ken Liu wants to write a novella or another novel in that time period of Dara, I'm all in. And I have so many spoiler thoughts about things that worked and didn't work for me and things that I want to question. Um, but I'm going to save those for the discussion. I just want to say that some of the big moments that I was looking forward to since like even book one or eh, more like book two paid off. And I didn't expect them to live up to their expectations. Like I had built this idea of what was going to happen in my head and Ken Liu actually did it better. And that is why he is a best-selling author, and I am not. <laughs> but, you know, as readers, we do get confident and think that we know what we want to see. And I started seeing things going one way, uh, specifically with a set of characters that were finally going to have a, an altercation. And I was like, oh, if he does that, if he doesn't do it this way, I'd be disappointed. He actually ended up doing it totally different, and I loved it. I really loved it. And that, that's an amazing feeling to know that you don't have any idea what's going to be coming. And it's not a curveball for the sake of a curveball. It all makes sense. It's all very logical. So I think that Speaking Bones is a fabulous book. I think a lot of the stuff that was set up in The Veiled Throne made it the book that it is, which is, in my opinion, uh, the second best book in the Dandelion Dynasty. I still rank Wall of Storms above it. I think that was the peak. But the highs of Speaking Bones are just as high as Wall of Storms. It's just the overall impact of the story um, 
was probably on the same level, but I think that there were things that were starting to grate on me a little bit after reading so much. Uh, I don't necessarily think that that's going to be the popular opinion. I know a lot of people have finished it and said Speaking Bones is their favorite. It's really close. Uh, like, it's definitely Wall Storms and Speaking Bones. And then Grace of Kings, and then probably The Veiled Throne. The Veiled Throne gets a bad rap just for the sole fact that, it, it, you know, the books were split. But this is a satisfying ending. I'm happy with this. I was kind of saying after I finished Wall of Storms, you know, and naming it maybe possibly book of the year, I was saying this might end up cracking into the top three or four series of all time for me. Now that I finish it, how do I feel? I think I would say that this is without a doubt in my top 10 series of all time. I think it would make that list. Top five, possibly. Uh, I feel a little less hyperbolic this time around because I've settled down a bit since Wall of Storms. I stand by the Wall of Storms is one of the best books I've ever read and probably the best sequel I've ever read. Uh, and Speaking Bones has to be one of the most satisfying conclusions to a series I've read as well. Like one of the best final books in a series. However, it wrapped up so well that it's like I feel content. Uh, not saying I wouldn't want more books in this world or, or anything dealing with Dara. I, I'm, I'm gonna miss this world. I lived in this. I know how it works. I know, you know, they, they figured out some inventions in this last book. I wanna see what comes of that. <laughs> but I feel content and I feel satisfied. And is there any better praise that you can give thousands and thousands of pages in a series than it felt right? It felt fitting. It got the ending it deserved. I really do. I, I really love The Dandelion Dynasty by Ken Liu. I think it's special. I think it's one of the most unique things that I've read while still feeling familiar in the genre and not, you know, bucking back against tropes just to do those things. In fact, this is probably one of the more optimistic series that I've read without shying away from some of the big hardships that come in life and also with ruling a dynasty. I feel like this is the best dynasty or secession story I've ever read. I'm not going to sit here and say the best ever in the fantasy genre because I haven't read everything in the fantasy genre, but I'll be surprised if I find something in the near future that tops this when it comes to political drama and the scheming is just outstanding. There are so many players to this game and the cast is so wide. Uh, it's phenomenal that everyone felt like a real person to me, especially book two on. Uh, and the characters that get introduced in the second half of the series are some of the best of all four books, which is just incredible. This had me hooked from the get-go, though. I, I was invested and emotionally invested in a lot of the cast, and Speaking Bones and the way it wrapped up some of the character arcs is just, hmm, I'll be thinking about it for a very long time. And there's a certain character in this series that I think deserves a character study it's, to its fullest extent, because I'm still not sure if this person is a genius, a good person, a bad person, a monster, a devil. I have no idea. I don't know how to feel about this character's actions throughout all four books. And, th and this is why I love this series, because I'm going to sit here and ponder it, have conversations about it that uh, I might have for years to come. And this is definitely something that I will reread. But I want to thank you so much for checking out this review. Drop me a like if you liked the video, dislike if you disliked it. If you loved it, think about subscribing. I'm going to be doing other massive series. Um, I need to read Lies of Locke Lamora. I'm going to be doing Wars of Light and Shadow Pitch anywhere. It's a whole bunch of stuff that you want to be around for. And hopefully, uh, maybe at one point, I will cover some more Ken Liu with his short story collections. And who knows, maybe I'll even interview Ken Liu on Chatting with Nuts. That, that's a goal of mine for the future. Um, but I did love the Dandelion Dynasty, and I do recommend it. But that's it for me today. Until I see you next time, be good, be safe. Remember to always keep turning the page. You got to give a big shout out to all my patrons, especially my King's Guard, which include Lauren, Henrik, Kai, Simon, Oscar, Stuart, Josephine, Ikaika, Amanda, RJ, Shad, Nicoletta, Tanner, Jennifer, Garrick, Frank, Fever, Jay, Sarah, Pat, Kevin, Ryan, Michael, Terrence, Wade, Darren, FM, Derry, Boss, Mitch, Sebastian, Benjamin, and Jobot. Thank you all so much. You're the best.